Hello everyone and happy February. Welcome to your Bake Along video for this month as part of the Barkman Branch Library's baking series. Hopefully this video is coming out to you on February 16th, which just happens to be Mardi Gras. Now, unfortunately, parades have been canceled for 2021. So I thought it would be really fun if for the month of February, we could do a recipe that has to do with Mardi Gras. So the recipe I'm going to try, and hopefully you'll be baking along with me at home, is going to be king cake. I first heard about king cake when I was in a high school French class, along with many other Mardi Gras and French related recipes. But I've never made it before, and it's something I've always wanted to try. In my brief research about the history of this recipe uh, and the different variations on it, I found a lot of different culinary takes, on, uh, particularly on the filling for this cake. I found everything from berry cream cheese to goat cheese and apples, and even just simple raisins and cinnamon spread. I'm going to be using a simpler recipe for this video, just to make it easier on all of us to obtain the ingredients. King cake is typically described as a braided circular or oval cake that is actually more similar to a brioche bread than a cake, and it is covered with icing and maybe sometimes sprinkles. For an extra festive flourish, the sprinkles can be colored in the official Mardi Gras colors, green, purple, and gold. Supposedly, green for faith, purple for justice, and gold for power. Another tradition of king cake is that there is usually some trinket or toy, or more commonly these days, a plastic baby hidden in the cake. This is a tradition we'll discuss further as we start making our own king cake, but for now, let's get started. For the bread part of our king cake, we will need three and a half cups of all-purpose flour, one package of rapid rise yeast, one cup of milk, a fourth a cup of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, two eggs, and six tablespoons of unsalted butter, softened and cut into 12 pieces. Step one, mix two and a half cups of the flour with the yeast in the mixing bowl of a stand mixer using the paddle attachment on low for about 30 seconds. Since I didn't have a stand mixer, you'll see me using the dough setting on our family's bread maker instead. So I just mix the flour and yeast together with a wooden spoon for about 30 seconds before putting it in the bread maker pan. And don't do what I did, which is to mix all of the flour in with the yeast. You're supposed to start with two and a half cups of the three and a half cups of flour and incorporate the last cup later. Step two, heat the milk. The fourth a cup of sugar and the one teaspoon of salt in a small saucepan over medium heat until the sugar is dissolved and the milk is between 120 and 130 degrees Fahrenheit. I just check the temperature with a gauge. Step three, with your mixer on low or with your bread maker pan started on the dough setting, you will mix your dry and liquid ingredients together until incorporated. Remember, this is still just the two and a half cups of flour, not the three and a half like I did here. As you can see, my bread maker, it's stirring very slowly, just starting to mix all the ingredients together. It did start to go a little faster uh, as it went through the dough making process. Then you're going to add the eggs one at a time and continue mixing until a shaggy dough forms. If you are using a stand mixer, you'll want to switch from a paddle attachment to a dough hook once you have a shaggy dough and start mixing in the remaining one cup of flour until you have a soft dough. 
Then add one piece of butter at a time until each piece is absorbed. Since mine didn't turn into a shaggy dough, probably because I had all of my flour in the basket at once, I just waited until the eggs had incorporated into the mixture and then started adding the butter one piece at a time and allowing them to mix in. So step four, after you've let the dough mix for eight minutes on low, checking on it every so often to make sure it's forming together, we're going to turn it out uh, onto a lightly floured surface and knead it by hand for a little bit just to make sure it's smooth and elastic before we form it into a ball. If it seems too dry, you can spray the dough with water or add a little more flour if it seems too sticky. If you are using a hook to knead the dough, you might want to stop every two minutes while it's mixing and clean off the hook. Once we're sure our dough is um, looking good, then we're going to put it into a greased bowl and turn it once, like I did here, so that the grease surface is on the top. Then we're going to cover it with plastic wrap and stick it in the refrigerator for an hour. I'd recommend using a larger bowl to hold your dough ball than I did, and you'll see why in a bit. Now, while the brown sugar I had in the pantry is good until June of this year, thank goodness, um, it's, uh, it's a little hard. So one tip I found uh, by Googling is that you can put some chunks in a microwave safe bowl and then cover that bowl with a damp paper towel uh, and then put it in the microwave for 20 second increments and then smooth it out with a fork uh, each time you put it in the microwave until it's more like uh, the brown sugar that we need. Once your brown sugar is softened, or if you just had regular brown sugar ready to go, you'll want two thirds a cup packed light brown sugar, one and a half teaspoons of ground cinnamon, and four tablespoons of unsalted butter, softened. Stirring this mixture together will be easier for you if you don't add the butter in one chunk like I did, but cut it into pieces first. And this is gonna be our cinnamon filling. So this is good to make while we're waiting for the dough to chill. And eventually it's gonna smooth out and look like a nice cinnamon filling. This is probably why you should use a bigger bowl to set your dough ball into while it's in the refrigerator. You can see it started going up over the top of the bowl, it'd probably be better for it to have a little more room. Now that the dough has been chilling for an hour, we're going to roll it into a 10 by 20 inch rectangle. So as you watch me struggle to get the dough rolled out to the correct size, <laughs> let's talk a little more about king cake. It is undecided how far back the tradition of this cake goes. In France, it was first mentioned in the 1300s, but its identity is not restricted to any one European country. There is evidence that cakes hiding beans existed during the time of the Roman Empire, when fava beans were a prized legume. Apparently, the meaning of these types of cakes changed during the Middle Ages to become associated with the Christian festival of Epiphany. In the late 1800s, it is thought that Mardi Gras revelers in New Orleans revisited the tradition of hiding a bean in the cake. However, the trinket in the cake has changed over time, including a wider introduction of plastic or porcelain babies in the 1950s, or the general fev, or small toy used in France. In New Orleans, during Mardi Gras, the person who found the bean in their slice of cake would be crowned king or queen of the ball that year, otherwise known as the king of the bean or the Lord of Misrule to serve as a master of ceremonies over the pandemonium that occurs during Mardi Gras. In a more private group setting, the recipient of the cake slice containing the bean or baby or toy or fev is charged with being responsible for bringing the king cake to next year's festivities. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of the idea of putting plastic in a cake, so you'll see me use an almond in mine. Once the dough is the right size, I spread the filling on the long side of the dough. 
spread it out evenly on just half. Then I folded the other half of the dough over and pat it down firmly to cover the filling and stick the two sides together. Then I carefully cut the dough into three long strips. A pizza cutter can also be used for this step as well. It might be a little easier than a knife. And if you're using a knife, please do be careful. Then once we have our three long strips, I folded the top edges together. And then I braided it. This is my first time braiding bread or doing anything like this before. I was a little nervous because the edges of the three strips weren't pressed together that the filling might slide around and fall out. But if you just work carefully, you should be okay. And basically braiding is taking one on the left side or the right side and folding it over the middle one so that the one that was on the left or right side becomes the middle and then you repeat on the other side. Every time I made another fold, I tried to make sure that the pressure was even on the braid so that the size of each side and each fold would look the same. So we'd have a more unified, hopefully we'd have a more unified <laughs> shape at the end. And then once you get to the end, what I did to try and hold them together was I twisted the edge and then folded that twist over on top of itself just a little bit. And then you're going to stretch out the braid a little bit until it reaches that 20 inches again before curling it in on itself to make a circle or oval. Good luck getting your pressed edges together in a way that looks good. I spent a lot more time than I needed to trying to adjust that. Now we're at step eight and it's time to move the ring of cake to a parchment lined baking sheet. I covered the dough with plastic wrap again and let it sit out and rise for another hour. When there was about 20 minutes left, I've started preheating the oven to 350 degrees. Here's what it looked like after an hour sitting out rising. And here's what my cake looked like after 30 minutes of baking. I checked on it every so often to make sure it wasn't getting too dark. And we wanted to have a nice golden brown color, baking it somewhere between 20 to 35 minutes. The cake needs to completely cool before putting on the icing. After I let it cool for a while, I flipped the cake and cut a slit into the bottom to hide my almond. But you can use whatever small trinket you have that you want to put in the cake. For step number nine, if you want to use the icing in the recipe, it calls for mixing one cup of powdered sugar, one tablespoon of milk, and one teaspoon of vanilla extract in a small bowl to form an icing. When I made this icing, I tried to put food coloring in it, 
since my colored sugar hack didn't work. And the icing was designed to be more of a glaze, so the colors didn't come through very well. So now instead, you'll see me get some regular sugar cookie icing and put food coloring in that instead. And that's what I used for the final decoration. I think it looks much nicer. If you did go to the grocery store and purchase colored sugars, and you're planning to use the glaze uh, from this recipe with the powdered sugar, milk, and vanilla extract, you'll want to add on the glaze after the cake has completely cooled and then immediately add on the sugars so that they stick to the, the icing. I alternated colors between the Mardi Gras colors of green, yellow, and purple. And just so you know, to make the purple, I mixed red and blue together. It's kind of a grayish purple, but it still worked. And there you have it. Here's our Mardi Gras king cake. This recipe, though being really fun, was actually pretty stressful. From having to make my own dough by myself for the first time, uh, and then messing it up when I put all the cups of flour in the bread maker at once, and then never having used the bread maker to do anything before. Uh, thankfully, we were just kneading it today. Maybe in another month, we'll work on bread. <laughs> but it looks great. <laughs> Hopefully this brings a little color to your February, to your Mardi Gras, even though we might be stuck inside, instead of going out and celebrating like we might normally do. But I hope you enjoyed following along with me uh -huh, during all my trials and tribulations with this recipe. Despite doing things wrong and changing things at the last minute, I seem to have the luck of the baking gods on my side, for which I'm very thankful. But I'm going to put this in the fridge and let it continue cooling down all the way. And then I'll be taking it to work and seeing what my coworkers think of it. I did hide an almond in the bottom, so I'll be able to slice it up and then we'll be able to play a game of who gets to be king for the day. But thank you for joining me for our February video. Once again, this is our second video of 2021 as part of the Barkman Branches baking series. <laughs> Hannah will be back with a recipe next month. I think she's gonna do a savory one this time, so it should be a lot of fun. I hope you're enjoying these bake-alongs, and I will see you all next time. Bye.